please stand for our call to worship. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let us go to him in prayer now. Our great Heavenly Father, we come before you again this day to continue our worship of you. We do praise your name. We are glad and joyful that you have called us to yourself, that you have brought us to this place so that we might worship you. Help us to do that, we pray, in spirit and truth. Help us to focus upon the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and put the cares of the world aside as we glory in what you have done in creation and salvation. We pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn with me to 101 and we will sing together, Come Thou Almighty King, 101. standing with me if you are able. We'll turn to Genesis chapter 16 as we turn to the hearing of God's word. First this evening from Genesis chapter 16. And let us pay heed to this word of God given to us for our instruction and in salvation and righteousness. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. 
And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahoi Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 60, 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. That's for the reading of Genesis. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And this is the text for this evening. We will be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to the third verse of chapter 12. Again, let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible, holy word of God given to us for our instruction. Verse 17, chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Thus for the reading of the word of God. Please be seated. And we will turn to a time of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, we do come to you this evening again because you are awesome, because you are a God of wonders and a God of might, because you are sovereign, because you are our Savior and you are our Lord, because you providentially care for us and you call us to worship you on this day, and so we come. We echo our prayers from this morning. We pray for our brothers and sisters within this congregation who face continued illness, physical stress, the strains of a long-lived life, We pray for the concerns this evening of the many cases of COVID that we have heard. We pray for your spirit to give them peace and endurance and patience through this time. We pray for your will to be done. We pray for you to use these things for your glory and for us to use them as a witness to what a great and awesome and mighty God that you are. We pray for, again, the many other issues, not just physical, financial, familial, the ordinary strains of life upon each of us. We ask that you would continue to move in our hearts to point us to you when times become more than we think we can bear. Help us to run the race that you have set before us with joy, with the understanding of the hope that we have and the fulfillment of the glorification that will come in our union with Christ. We do pray for our civil government, especially at this time as we come upon a presidential election. We pray for your will to be done. We pray for us to remember our mission, our pilgrimage, our true citizenship that lies in heaven. Help us to remember that you are king, that you are sovereign, and that all things happen according to your ordainment. We pray for you to put into place 
during this election, men and women that will honor you, that will glorify you in the decisions that they make, in the policies that they try to enact. We pray for revival, reformation within our land. We pray that it would happen through this election by your almighty power. And whatever the case, as we find out what your will is come a couple of days from now or weeks, that we understand that it is part of your plan to sanctify us and to make us a light and to make us salt into this world. Let us not waste this opportunity. Let us not waste the moments that we have to speak to others about the comfort and peace that we have in you. We pray for this upcoming season, even now. Help us to begin to prepare this time of thanksgiving, this time of, uh, of remembrance of the incarnation of Christ to come and dwell among his people and offer his life up as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. Help us to keep these things on our mind help us to remember to remind others that we are not thankful in a general sense, but that we are thankful to you and our thanksgiving is to you. Help us to use these opportunities over the next couple of months to speak of thankfulness to God, to speak to joy in the coming the first time and the second of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just pray this evening for this message that you will bring to us from your servant, Kay, that we will be blessed, that we will, you will apply these things to our hearts that come from your word so that we might grow in our knowledge and understanding and then our application of what it is you would teach us tonight. Help us, we pray, in all of these things, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remain seated, take your hymnals, and we will sing together, Shout for the Blessed Jesus Reigns, number 369.
Well, thank you again for this opportunity that I have to stand before you and share God's Word with you, I hope, successfully and correctly. And I want to continue on with what I started last week to some degree with the concept they desired a better country as we look at Hebrews chapter 11. And we're not going to focus quite so much on the last part of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through the end of chapter 11. We will spend a little bit of time there. But recall from Hebrews eleven sixteen. but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And as you noticed, as we read our sermon scripture, that there was a lot of covering a lot of the same things that we talked about last time, examples of faith. Unlike Todd, I have the uh, privilege of being able to spend a lot more time in preparation. Not that that makes my sermons any better, because uh, they're not, but uh, just gives me more time to reflect. And uh, Ray, uh, as I preached last time, he just mentioned, well, you could just kind of go on in Hebrews 11, so that's what I decided to do. But we're not going to spend as much time looking at the, uh, at the individuals like we did last time. But rather, we're going to look again at this concept of walking and living by faith. And as you can see, the writer of Hebrews covers considerable territory in these last few verses. Again, we have Abraham mentioned, as it was also uh, his story uh, in our scripture reading tonight. But we have mentioned the story of how God told Abraham that he was going to sacrifice his only son. We have that in verses uh, chapter, uh, 17 to 19 of Hebrews 11. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise, was offering up his only begotten son. It was as uh, to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. Verse 19, it says, He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he would receive him back as a type. And again, this seems like almost a, a contradiction because we know that Abraham had been promised over and over again that his descendants would be as numerous as the sands of the sea or as the stars of heaven. And Isaac, who uh, had not come yet, would be an essential part of that process. But Abraham, even in that, trusted God. Verse 19 again says, he considered that God, even though he was called to sacrifice his son, he considered that God was able to raise people from the dead from which he would receive him back. In the rest of this section, verse 20 to the end of the chapter, again, the writer covers rapidly these examples of faith. And as I was thinking about this, one side thought here is that none of these individuals were perfect. They had their flaws. And I think that's comforting for us. But in each of the examples that we would look at and are stated here, they are examples of individuals in spite of that who fully trusted God. We'll look a little bit at the flaws they had in a moment. There's one section that there's a little bit more time spent, and that was a section in the discussion of Moses, verses 23 to 27. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for months by his parents because he saw he was a beautiful, because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Consider the reproach of considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. And so we have this concept here again of the future aspect of the way that these people look, looking forward to what was promised not experiencing those promises necessarily themselves, 
but looking forward to that. And I thought verse 26 was kind of an interesting verse, and I'm not sure I perceived it correctly, but I'll share some thoughts with you on it. Verse 26 says, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And there are a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, Again, these are from one of the commentators that I use. And that person said, this means either that he was willing to bear the reproaches incident to his belief that the Messiah would come and, uh, and that he gave up his fair prospects in Egypt with that expectation. And again, we can see a principle there. He was willing to trust God to give up what was an obvious benefit short term, looking forward to something that had long term value. Or it could mean that he endured such reproaches as Christ suffered. Or it could be that the writer used the impression as a sort of technical phrase, well understood in his time to denote sufferings endured in the cause of religion. And these were notes from Barnes. And then we can see in Hebrews 11, 32 to 39, it gives us uh, some pictures of what these individuals were dealing with. Let's just take a moment to look at that. Hebrews 11, 32 to 34. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the eyes, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, and put four armies to flight. And again, we can see the type of things these individuals dealt with. And again, as I said, they were not perfect in some of their actions. Abraham, for example, seemed to question God at times about his promises given in the covenants. Uh, Chapter 15 of Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not fear, Abraham. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham said, and here's what I'm referring to, O Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born of my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of God came to him. This man will not be your heir, but who, but one who will come forth from your own body and he shall be your heir. And we just looked at the section where God asked him to take him and sacrifice. And yet Abraham was willing to trust God even in that circumstance. Gideon, for example, recall he had to have two signs before he would believe what God was telling him would happen. We see that in Judges 6. Samson also had to go through being blinded and become a slave before he understood what it meant to walk by faith. Jephthah is one that we're not quite so familiar with. His story is in Judges, the 11th chapter. And if you recall, well, let, let me just read a few of those verses. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mizpah and Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he went on to the sons of Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then I shall be, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Well, if you recall, he had a great success against, uh, in these battles that he had. And when he went home, the first person to come out of his house was his own daughter which he was going to be required to sacrifice since he'd given it to the Lord. So again, these individuals had their flaws, and yet they trusted God. David, again, his fall with Bathsheba, we see that in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. So all of these individuals, I think, give us an understanding that they weren't perfect uh, like we're not, and yet they still trusted God, were faithful, to the best of their ability to live by faith and not by sight. We see in 11, uh, Hebrews 11, 35 and 36, it says, women receive back their dead by resurrection. 
and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. And it says that they were ill-treated for their faith. They faced many difficult situations. We see in, uh, also in uh, this section, and again, this is the, fact, uh, the section that I want to focus on, Hebrews eleven thirty seven through Hebrews 12, 3. Let me just take a moment to read that for us. They were sawn. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, and all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised <clears throat> because God had promised something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. <clears throat> and then we go on to the first three verses of chapter 12. I know when you hear me preach and pray and stuff, you probably attempt to try and clear your throat, you know, clear my throat a lot. Uh, that's what seven weeks of radiation on your throat do. I used to be able to sing a little bit and I used to be able to have a better uh, speaking voice, but I struggle a little bit at times. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, I just, my computer just did something to me. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who also has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So again, we're gonna focus on this section. And I wanna begin first by looking at a Hebrews 11:38, And there's a phrase in there that just kind of struck home to me. And it's the phrase that says, men of whom the world was not worthy. I wanna read this quote. The world was so wicked that it had no claim that such holy men should live in it. These poor, despised and persecuted men living as outcasts and wanderers were of a character far elevated above the earth. This is the most beautiful expression. It is at once a statement of their imminent holiness and of the wickedness of the rest of mankind. The world in shutting them out, shut out from itself a source, a blessing. In condemning them, the world condemned itself. And so, so again, this is a picture we have of these individuals. And then it goes on in Hebrews 11, 39, and all these gained approval through their faith, all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised. And I wanna read this to you from the Amplified Version because I kinda of like the way it, uh, it states it. And all these, though they were one divine approval by, meaning by means of their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised. They were all commended and approved on account of their confidence in God. And if you take a look at the actual placement of the words in the Greek, it shows the importance of the words. And I want to give that to you. Here's how it would actually be read if you looked at the Greek. And these all having been commended through faith did not receive the promise. That is, they lived their lives facing often challenging circumstances trusting God day in and day out. And by this, they gained God's approval. God was pleased with their obedience. And I think it's important for us to understand in this section, it's the focus on the realization again of the future promises that would be fulfilled. I think that's a problem in my own life. You know, I want what I want and I want it now. I'm not willing to wait for it. Too often, we're like the children of Israel 
uh, in Exodus 32 when Moses delayed on the mountain. And what happened? They made an image of God to worship rather than waiting for a, uh, Moses, trusting God for the future. Then we have 11, uh, Hebrews 11.40 where it says, because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And again, we have God having provided or determined on giving something better than any of them could realize and which we are now permitted to enjoy. That was a quote. That is, God was giving them promises that they were not allowed to see their fulfillment of. We are permitted now to see what they've referred to and in part at least to witness their completion because we look back on it. And though the promises uh, was made to them, the fulfillment more particularly pertains to us. And also I think the implication here is that they will realize the fulfillment of each of these at their glorification and that will be true for us. In the second part of Hebrews 11.40, it says so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And I found this a little bit difficult to understand, but I looked at Barnes and here's what he said. He said that it is complete. The whole system of revelation was not completed at once or in one generation. It required successive ages to make the system complete so that it might be said that it was finished or perfected. And I thought about this. You think about the sequence of individuals that were involved in waiting for these promises as God, God gave Abraham uh, the initial covenant. Then there was Isaac, Jacob and Esau, Joseph, and there's others in here that I'm not even referring to. Uh, the the uh, leaders uh, that where they ended up in Egypt and eventually the Exodus, and then it goes on even in the story. And that's another reason why it's so important that we are covenantal in our view of Scripture and that we look at the whole Scripture as, it is, as an integrated system rather than just the way that it is often presented nowadays as bits and pieces. And then I love this section, and this really was where most of our focus will be. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And again, let's look at the first verse, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. And again, this is a very familiar passage. I'm sure that most of you have heard many sermons on it. But what we see here in this chapter is how the apost uh, the individual who wrote Hebrews is showing the nature and the power of the faith that was shown in the lives of these individuals. And he will now begin to encourage the individuals and us on how to apply these principles in our lives. And so if I do another sermon on this later on, I'll probably continue on with chapter 12. I want you to first notice it says, the great cloud of witnesses that we have. That is those who have borne testimony to us about this truth. And I think it is how we should live with that truth as well. I want you to notice first it says, so great a cloud of witnesses. I don't think the word great is actually in the uh, Greek, but it certainly is implied by the word cloud, for it gives the indication of a large group of individuals that have given us examples to live by. I think we need to be careful here too as well and not to see this as a window in heaven with these individuals looking down on us in real time at our actions. These individuals are not modern day witnesses, but have witnesses to us by their example. That is why it's so important for us who live now, who have children and grandchildren and others looking at our lives, people that we work with, by God's grace that we live a consistent walk in our confession. That's so important. There's much more we could say about that, but let us continue on with the second part of verse one. It says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And the idea here is let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, every unnecessary weight. 
I think as it is applied to the Christian, it means that we should remove all which obstructs our progress in the Christian life. And I thought about this in my own life. What are those things, those unnecessary weights that encumber my own growth of faith? I thought about it. I fear too much that I've clung to all my life those things that are not even necessarily bad things, but they're things, they're distractions from what's important. I think Todd mentioned that so wonderfully in his sermon to us this morning. Here's a partial quote from Barnes on this. Thus, it is fair to apply it to whatever would be an impediment to in our effort to win the crown of life. It's not the same thing in all persons. In one, it may be pride. In another, vanity. In another, worldliness. In another, a violent or almost ungovernable temper. In another, a corrupt imagination. In another, a heavy, leaden, inseparable heart. In another, some improper or unholy attraction. Again, it's not the same for each of us, but whatever it is, these are encumbrance, these are unnecessary weights that entangle and uh, corrupt us and, and make it more difficult for us. And then we have this, and the sin which so easily entangles us. I remember my son one time had been preaching a series of sermons to his church in Harrisburg, and he was preaching about how the church was being blessed and going on and on. And finally, he got to the point where he said, and again, kind of like what Todd's been doing for us here, telling us how the people were failing to live the kind of lives that they need to live. And he said one of his uh, parishioners came up after that one sermon uh, where he was pointing out to them what the problem was. And the, the guy said, well, I thought it was because of the homosexuals in California. Well, that's not the case. It's because of the kind of lives that we live here ourselves. And it's always interesting how I'm able to pick out those things so easily in the lives of others, how I can define their sin, and yet so often fail to identify the sin in my own life. We're all familiar with Matthew 7, 3 and 5. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And you know, you see this contrast. The word that they use here is the idea of the log is a wooden beam. A splinter is a speck compared to a wooden beam or a log that is something that is big enough to hold something up. And again, I think the idea of Hebrews 12.1, I think from the Amplified gives us a little better understanding. It says, and the sin which so readily, the last part of it, deftly and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And this word that's used uh, is rendered Easily beset, besetting sin. It, and I can't say the Greek word, but it doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament, but, and it properly means standing well around, the things that are standing well around, and hence denotes that that which is near or at hand or readily occurring. And again, there are lots of meanings that we could take here, but it's the idea that that sin that so easily entangles us the sin that hangs on us, that those things which are full of peril. And then the verse closes with this, and let us run with patience, endurance, and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. And again, I think that says a lot. Let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence that appointed course of the race that is set before us. And again, there's much more that we could say about that. And then we go on to Hebrews 12 too. And it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first part there, fixing our eyes on Jesus, we have this admonition, keeping our eyes on Jesus. 
And I have to confess to you that so often in today's world, I find it follow to, hard to follow this admonition. There are so many distractions to our thinking, causing anxiety and concern. And sometimes these anxieties and concerns are over whether my life is going to continue to remain to be comfortable or not. We have to avoid those. And again, as we look at this, we are to look to his holy life, to his patient and perseverance in trials, to what he endured in order to obtain the crown and to his final success and triumph. And I also believe, as we think about this, that we need to focus on some words of Jesus, some exhortations to us. And I have several very brief ones here I want to share. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. From Mark, we have this. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, from Matthew 12, 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever hum humbles himself shall be exalted. Again, from Matthew do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And we could go on. There are others. I thought about Todd's the end of Todd, well, actually the whole message, but what he said this morning at the end of his message about how God had given us these prophecies in the past that had been fulfilled so that we can have the confidence that he will fulfill the promises that he's made for the future. And then it goes on and says about this Jesus who is the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith in Hebrews 12, 2. An author is an originator or a creator as of a theory or a plan. And again, the Greek word translated here for author can also mean captain, chief leader, or prince. Other translations use author instead of prince. From this, we can deduce that Christ is the originator of our faith in that he begins it as well as the captain and the prince of our faith. This indicates that Jesus controls our faith, steers it as a captain steers a ship, ship, presides over it and cares for it as a monarch presides over and cares for his people. And then it says the word perfecter, again in Hebrews 12, 2. And again, this only appears one time in the New Testament and it means literally completer or finisher and speaks of bringing something to its conclusion. So you put these two words together, we see Jesus as God both creates and sustains our faith. We know that saving faith is a gift from God, not something we come with with our own, and that the gift comes from Christ, its creator. He's also the sustainer of our faith, meaning that true faith cannot be lost, taken away, or given away. This is a source, ought to be the source of great comfort for us as believers, especially in times of doubt and spiritual struggle. Christ has created our faith and he will watch over, care for it, and sustain it. And again, I want to read this quote. We know that saving faith is a gift from God. I want to emphasize this, not something we come up with on our own. And that gift comes from Christ, its creator. He's also the sustainer of our faith, meaning that true faith cannot be lost, taken away, or given away. And then it goes on, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And certainly if you think about the cross, it was not a joy, but it says for the joy set before him endured the cross, for the joy set before him. And again, I believe we can see in this statement even in relation to, to Christ, the future fulfillment as, aspect of what he did on the cross. I can't believe for a minute that the cross experience itself was joyful. It was a terrible way, way to die. 
The beatings alone could easily kill an ordinary man. And then the essential agony of the suffocation that happened and the struggling to breathe as they hung there on the cross. I can remember Marilyn when she was working in the hospital in South Carolina telling about people that really bad COPD and how they had to struggle to breathe and how difficult it was for them. You can imagine as you uh, maybe have had an experience. I remember uh, had a friend whose, whose daughter was um, some sort of a physical therapist type person, but she was wanting to give them an illustration of how people with real bad COPD struggle. And so she gave everybody a straw and they said, put that straw in your mouth and breathe through that straw. That's how people with COPD have to live their lives. And that was part of the death on the cross. So it certainly was not a joyful thing, but Jesus was seeing the long-term benefit of his work. Those that would be saved from the justifiable wrath of God against their sin. And I can't think of anything much better than that. And it says he endured. And again, as I thought about this, how this applies to the examples of faith we have. And that word itself means to stay under, to remain, to undergo, to bear, to have fortitude, to persevere. A very strong word. And certainly that was true of Jesus as it's stated in this verse. But as we look at other examples of these individuals, we can also realize how they endured as well, trusting God for promises that many of them would never see. He endured the cross. Nowadays, the cross for many is a form of jewelry, even worn by individuals who despise Jesus by their lifestyle. But back in the days of, of Christ's life, the cross was a despised method of execution only for the worst criminals. And then it says, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Barnes says this again. He was exalted to the highest place of dignity and honor in the universe. The sentiment here is imitate the example of the great author of he, in view of the honor and joy set before him, endured the most severe sufferings to which human, the human frame can be subject and the form of death which is regarded as the most shameful. So amidst all the severe trials to which you are exposed on account of religion, patiently endure all for the glorious reward, the happiness and the triumph of heaven are before you. And then finally, Hebrews 12:3 says, for consider him. And this word here again is a Greek word from which we get the word to analyze. Consider Jesus, consider what he did. Constantly look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus said in his word. Look at what he tells us to do in obedience. Follow what he says. And this meaning carries that exact concept to attentively reflect on what he did. The first readers of Hebrews uh, were going through trials because of their faith and were tempted to go back to the Jewish faith. And the writer of this letter was giving them encouragement and reason why they needed to endure. And that's what it says, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. And again, that's one of the things to consider. This is a reference, of course, to the opposition that Jesus faced during his earthly ministry, dealing with primarily the religious leaders of his day. And again, Barnes gives us this idea that we are to pursue the path of duty, follow the dictates of conscience, let the world say what it will about it. In doing this, we cannot find a better example than Jesus so that you will not grow weary, it says, and lose heart. The best means of leading a faithful Christian life amidst the opposition that we may encounter is to keep the eye steadily fixed on our Savior I remember this quote, and it's a familiar, a familiar one from Cory Ten Boom, the Dutch lady who was imprisoned by the Germans during World War II for her faith. She said this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. If you look at God, you will be at rest. And so we see in this how those who walk by faith given to us in uh, Hebrews 11, and this discussion we've had in Hebrews 12 so far showed their trust and faith by looking under the author and perfecter of their faith, our Lord Jesus Christ, and trusting 
in what he did for us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, again, we thank you and we praise you that we can trust you. Lord, I pray even in my own life that you will help me to do that better, more faithfully. Help me to not be fearful of whatever might happen, but to look to you and to trust you, wholly enduring whatever might have to be endured for the sake of the glorification that will come to each of us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you are able, and we'll turn to number 649 to sing More Love to Thee, O Christ, 649. Blessing from our Lord, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. <laughs>